Stay hungry, stay foolish. The Innovation Show is proudly brought to you by Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. Let's get into the next installment of Brains, Beliefs and Biases, this time Bias Interrupted with Joan Williams. Let's get into it. Companies spend billions of dollars annually on diversity efforts with remarkably few results. Too often, diversity efforts rest on the assumption that all that's needed is an earnest conversation about privilege. That's not enough. To truly make progress, we need to stop celebrating the problem and instead take effective steps to solve it. Through her exhaustive research, fresh evidence and first-hand work with companies, our guest today shows how it's done and reassuringly how easy it is to get started. Let me share some of the fantastic chapter titles for anybody from CEO to head of HR to head of L&D to DEI or CDO in an organization. Get a load of these chapters. It is made for you. What's the path forward? Is bias training worthless? We're a meritocracy. Are you asking us to change that? Why do some groups need to be politically savvier than others? And are you saying that white men have it easy? I don't feel privileged. How can HR and DEI departments work together to interrupt bias in basic business systems? And how can individual managers help to move the needle? And even what does the CEO need to do to finally deliver on DEI goals? It is a fantastic book. It's a playbook. It gives the problems and it gives the solutions through science-based research that is done by today's guest. The name of the book is Bias Interrupted, creating inclusion for real and for good. The author is with us today, Joan C. Williams. Welcome to the show. Delighted to be here. It's great to have you on the show. And to mark the occasion, Joan, I have to thank you sincerely for joining us. Your daughter's in labor now. Congratulations on your first granddaughter. Thank you. I am very excited. We have that in the background, so I'm very aware of that. So let's get into it. You say, while we might empathize with organizations and leaders who seek the magic bullet, so many do, looking for the grand gesture to solve the DEI problem in one fell swoop, it doesn't exist. What does exist, you tell us, is a series of 1% changes that, with persistence, can help root out the bias that too often subverts our ideals of meritocracy. You call these changes bias interrupters, hence the title. These are evidence-based, metrics-driven tools. I'd love to start with that because I love the title and I love the idea of bias interrupters. Too often we um, approach diversity and inclusion issues as a sincere conversation, and I'm, I'm all in favor of sincere conversations, but they are not an effective organizational change tool. Um, If you have challenges with diversity, it's typically because subtle and frankly, not so subtle forms of bias are constantly being transmitted through your basic business systems, through hiring, through performance evaluations, and through everyday workplace interactions. And so the answer is to fix the business systems and to arm people to understand what bias looks like on the ground so they can start interrupting it. But that is a more complicated process than just one conversation. You have done so much work on this, your previous books, and you've built on that, both through research, through scar tissue, through working with organizations that you work with as well as a consultant. And you tell us that at the work at the Center for Work Life Law, your team invented a simple survey that picks up biases based on race, gender, social class, origin, and age, and you call it the Workplace Experiences Survey, WES. And in 14 years of nearly 18,000 people in different industries and organizations, over a whole decade, you consistently found the same five patterns of bias. I love the titles of these. I don't love what the patterns are, but I'd love you to share them with us. It's really important that people understand how bias plays out 
in everyday workplace interactions. A lot of bias trainings talk about like the implicit association test and the cognitive bases of bias. That's super interesting, but it's like a college lecture. It doesn't tell you what to do. Um, and so my team for mm, close to 15 years, depending on how you count, has really boiled down the common forms of workplace bias into five simple patterns. The first we call prove it again. Some groups have to prove themselves more than others. The second we call the tightrope. And that really stems from the fact that authoritativeness and ambition are more readily accepted from some groups than others. The third is the strongest form of gender bias, the maternal wall. Gender bias triggered by motherhood is super strong uh, and super pervasive too, unfortunately. The fourth is um, like prove it again and tightrope triggered both by race and by gender. And that's called the tug of war when bias against a group fuels conflict within the group. And then finally, there are certain kinds of racial stereotypes and kind of distinct experiences by race that differ for different groups. And so that's the five, the fifth pattern, racial stereotyping. And as you mentioned, social class origin and age also can trigger particularly that first um, type of bias, the prove it again, and social class can trigger, trigger um, tug of war as well. I found so many of these biases so reflective. I was saying to you before we came on air of people in innovation, because they're about minorities in particular, for example, the tightrope or the tug of war bias, or as you say, the, the crabs in a bucket effect that happens. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I felt actually that if you think of a, a group of innovators or somebody who's neurodiverse in a group, they yes. often feel these exact same biases. But one of the things that I, I thought would call out up front is, as you say, what you want to do here first is make bias and privilege, which is invisible to many people, visible. That's the very first step, because many people are kind of going, we don't have a problem. You kind of go, well, that's because you're a white male. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, especially a white male from a um, relatively privileged family, really the most, uh, we have lots of data points. We, we got tons of data. Um, but in many ways, here's the most important data point in study after study, company after company, typically 80 to 90% of white men say they have fair access to career enhancing assignments. But the percentage, for example, in one, uh, in one sample, the percentage of women of color who said the same was 53%. So in many ways, white men feel like they're functioning in a meritocracy. They feel that they're getting fair access to the opportunity to advance. Um, and how are they to know that other people are just having in the same environment, having an incredibly different experience. And so you really need a very simple language to explain that to people and to talk to them about how bias plays out in the ground. I'll give you another example of something that comes up again and again. These patterns are so entrenched. Um, often the single largest divergence, we measure every group against white men, um, the single largest divergence very often is in um, the, the question, I get interrupted more than my colleagues. In one data set, if you can believe it, it was women were 44 percentage points more likely than men to report that. And trying to get ahead and um, get your ideas out, if you're being constantly interrupted, that pushes you onto the tightrope of like, do you say like, let me finish, in which case you have a, you're a difficult woman and you have a personality problem? Or do you uh, spend a lot of time and energy trying to figure out how to get a word in edgewise without being seen as difficult? So those are the kinds of ways that bias plays out on the ground that we just need to explain to people. I mean, if they haven't had the experience, they don't know. And if you're like me, uh, a white man, and from a fairly good education, you think we're making progress. Let's share woke washing, because this is what a lot of us are experiencing, and it's masking a problem that's still there. Yeah, this is the um, when uh, a company 
does nothing more, for example, than issue a statement of solidarity with people of color. It's not a bad thing, but it's not organizational change. Don't kid yourself. It is the process of um, uh, of symbolically embracing social change. Uh, it's not going to change your organizational culture. And sometimes it's done in good faith. Very often it's done in good faith. Sometimes it's just done cynically. Like, oh, let's just tick this damn box and go on to it. Uh, go on to the next thing. So um, these statements of racial solidarity um, and statements during Me Too um, about, you know, these these public um, these these publicity statements, you know, they're publicity, not a bad thing, not organizational change. And we see that a lot for our audience, Joan, people in change and, and transformation and innovation. Sometimes them being hired is the tick the box effort and there's no change being made. And it's so frustrating for the people being put in those roles. And we'll come back to those people who run these diversity programs because I have it's lots so of advice for those people. <laughs> yeah. And, and the book is so useful for that as well. And biasinterrupters.org. And I want to get that out straight away for those people who don't stay with us. Biasinterrupters.org, full of toolkits, full of publications. Some of the brilliant diagrams that Joan has just mentioned there as well, they're peppered throughout the book, all there. And it's an unbelievable resource for people trying to drive that change. About the, uh, the www.biasinterrupters.org website, we have a lot of free open access tools. And one of them is just a two-page document, I kid you not, talking about how the five patterns of bias commonly play out in performance evaluations and in an experiment, we found that just having people read through that out loud takes well under five minutes, increase the performance evaluations and the bonuses <clears throat> of um, every traditionally disadvantaged group that we measured. Even things like how to run a meeting, questionnaires on are yeah. you being interrupted? Everything's in there. Fantastic resource. The quote, Joan, I'd love you to expand upon this quote, I thought we were making progress before what, what I realized it's just woke washing. You say the large differences between white men and other groups are all the more significant because small amounts of biases can have such big effects. Sure. One study used a mathematical model to see what would happen if there was only a 5% gender bias in promotion decisions, a much smaller level of bias than exists in many companies today. After eight rounds of promotions, an organization that started 16 out of 58% women would be only 29% women. And you say, like interest, bias compounds. Compounds, exactly. And actually, there's now an even newer study that's, uh, again, this is just doing the math. You start out with 50-50 men and women, and after eight iterations with a 5% bias, there's only 2% of women in the C-suite. So small forms of bias um, are, have, can have pr profound effects. And again, we, have, we find big forms of bias um, sometimes. If you're a CEO and you don't think you have a problem, I highly recommend reading this book because it's often hidden in plain sight. Another excerpt, Joan, that speaks volumes is something that I mentioned to you, I see it so much, so much in my work in innovation. You inform us that although at most companies, the in-group is composed chiefly of white men, not all white men are in the in-group because not all of them have the same experience. In particular, the experience of professionals who are the first generation, first gen college mm -hmm. graduates differs from that of professionals from college educated families, first gen professionals, including white men report more bias and lower levels of belonging, though this varies a lot by industry, your data suggests it's far stronger in industries like law and real estate investing, which depends greatly on socializing and cultural capital that in industries like engineering, which depend chiefly on technical knowledge, it differs massively. Coming from a family with university educated parents is very different from coming from a family where the parent where your parents didn't go to university. One of my favorite studies, in fact, um, 
it was one of these matched resume studies. So this, they sent out to, this was in the US in law firms. They sent out to law firms, um, like a, about 150 resumes, all of them of white men. But they, some one resume was identical um, to the other, except for the hobbies. One resume listed polo, sailing, classical music as interests. The other listed counseling first generation university students, um, country music, and pick up soccer. And Mr. Polo got 12 times the number of callbacks as Mr. Country Music with the same qualifications. It's really important to add social class to your diversity initiative for a number of reasons. First of all, social class affects people's ability to get hired and their their experience thereafter very often. Um, secondly, if you think about and you focus on the other major vectors of social inequality, like race and gender, and you don't focus on social class, that will be really alienating to um, uh, white men from non college, uh, university educated families, because they'll say, I'm being described as privileged, and I'm just not. So this is all BS. And the third reason, uh, it's true in the US, and I wonder if it's true um, uh, in the UK as well. In the US, um, about two thirds of first generation students, first generation university, first, first gen, we call them, parents didn't go to university, now you're going to university. Two thirds of those students are, are people of color. And you can address the experience that they're having as people of color, but if you don't address the experience that they're having as first gen, you won't even be effective with respect to people of color. I found this myself, Joan, and I'll fully admit this. I went to a private school in Ireland. The private school played rugby. Rugby is a, call it an upper class sport. And there's a boys club in there. Like It's very beneficial for getting jobs, for getting yeah. access to opportunities. And I, when I read this book, your book, I was like, going, yeah, I've, I've absolutely had access to the privilege and the opportunities that yeah. that provides. When I arrived at Yale, Univer Yale College um, as a, you know, a college freshman, I already knew 14 people because I, this, these were my social networks. Um, my husband who came, whose father was a factory worker, he didn't know anyone. I wasn't a first gen in college, but I certainly benefited. I remember my dad, cause I wanted to go to a public school. I remember having an argument with my dad and he's going to go on the access to opportunities. This will give you, you will not know about, it will only make sense in the future. And I absolutely benefit from that. And I do think, as you say in the book, you can't talk about bias without talking about social class, it has such a dramatic effect on outcomes for people. And we don't have to decide what's the more important. These are all important. Um, they all have independent effects. Uh, but in the, our database of 18,000 people, as you mentioned, again and again and again and again, you have the experience of white men as a group differing from the experience of every other group. And if you ask about social class in many industries, as you point out, it's really the in-group is, um, you know, the, the white men who went to private school and therefore know, know all, all the right people through rugby. That's the in-group. Yeah, and as we'll get to later on, then you're thinking the same, you have the same education, you have the same way of thinking, you can't see perspective because you don't have, you've only got one perspective on things. Yeah, there's no view from nowhere. So let's dive into chapter two examines the bad rap that bias training has got. And indeed, you asked the question here, is it worthless? And then you dive into, for example, you give some of those bad rap studies, and then you put them under the microscope one of which was the 2006 study. Maybe we'll share that with our audience. The 2006 study was done by two friends of mine, very rigorous, um, Frank Dobbin and Sandra Kalev, uh, and actually Aaron Kelly, I think was on that study too. And what they did is they just used um, uh, Equal Opportunity Commission records to measure whether companies that had given a bias training, and it was, I, I can't remember exactly, it was like a, a 10 or 20 year period, but it was early. It was very early. So it was all by definition before 2006. 
And a lot of it was in the in the 1990s when you had very early bias trainings that were kind of sensitivity trainings. Um, and then you had a little bit of the second generation of implicit association test trainings where you described cognitive processing. And none of those trainings really set, gave described what bias looked like on the ground or gave people any strategies for using it. And a lot of them were, were, were done by people who didn't know the literature. And guess what? They weren't effective. <laughs> you know, it's really um, garbage in, garbage out. It's, um, and so, you know, the, the stunning finding is that if you give a garbage uh, bias training, it is not going to help. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> if you have a garbage sales plan, that won't help either. We don't abandon sales for that reason. Um, we get a better approach. And um, so now there is, there's the new approach to bias training, um, which has been shown actually in a very rigorous experiment out of University of Wisconsin to have concrete effects, um, is similar to our bias training. It's called the Individual Bias Interrupters Workshop. And it's um, it's it presents the evidence. It describes how bias plays out. Um, and it puts people um, in groups of six with a specific example um, so they can talk with each other about how they would feel comfortable interrupting this specific kind of bias the next time they see it. Um, and so um, just to give you an example, one very common prove it again effect is what we call the stolen idea. Other people get credit for an idea I originally offered, sometimes called mansplaining um, or white peating. Uh, in the U.S. And um, we have big effects, both by race and gender on that. So we say, you know, here's the um, science of why this happens. Here's an example of how it happens. You just saw the stolen idea. You're sitting in a meeting and people sit around with their colleagues and discuss how they would feel comfortable interrupting the bias. And they come up typically with a range of things, depending on where they are in the organization um, and their you know, disposition. But somebody always comes up with something like that. Um, you know, Aiden, I've been thinking about that idea ever since Joan first said it. You've added really something important. I wonder if Joan wants to take that the next step. And so you provide people with um, ways of interrupting bias that don't require them to spend too much political capital or alienate anyone. Um, this is in sharp contrast, for example, to the, to the Google training about 10 years ago, where the focus was on calling out the bias. And my attitude is like, if that's the way you want to spend your political capital, God bless, this is my life's work. But that's not the way most people want to spend their political capital at work. And what you need to give people is these very um, low key strategies. And again, and again, even to super hostile audiences, I have to say, um, we have uh, um, uh, 80 to 90 percent of people typically saying they've learned new ways of interrupting bias and often um, around 80 percent say they will use one or more of them going forward. So um, garbage in, garbage out, but there are models for an effective bias training. It requires people to um, solve the problem for themselves. And people feel very comfortable. You say, here's the evidence. Here's the problem. Can you solve it? They go, yes, I can. That really resonated with me, the whole idea about the idea stealing, because in innovation, one of the things that happens all the time is that. So you're ahead of innovation. You're desperately trying to get a project over the line. Then somebody fancies your project and steals it. And you yes. ask yourself a question, like kind of going, which is the lesser of two evils? If they back the idea, I'll get it done. And oftentimes you have to let it go. It's so difficult. It's horrible when that when yeah. you experience that. But there's a term I wanted to share that you shared. I love the language in the book. And this is one of the things about this book. It gives you a lexicon that you can use that becomes a common language across the organization. Even how to deal, as Joan said there, with somebody stealing an idea, how to call it out and do it in a dignified way. But one of the terms, Joan, you use with reference to your successful workshops is cognitive override. Bias is inevitable. You know, stereotypes are out there. Most of them were reinforced yesterday, will be reinforced today, and they will be reinforced tomorrow. Stereotypes are a fact of life, um, including stereotypes about 
who is competent and stereotypes about who is entitled to be kind of an all out go getter, which are two stereotypes that are profoundly impactful in professional jobs. So we know those stereotypes are out there. Um, stereotype activation, we also know, is uh, inevitable. It's extremely, extremely difficult to stop. But just because a stereotype is triggered doesn't mean you can't override it. Stereotype application is controllable. And um, we all know this. I mean, lots of things jump into our mind that we actually do not say at work. <laughs> and we, why we have that cognitive override of like, this isn't appropriate. Um, and so that's, you know, this is, again, this is not rocket science. This is something that we already do at work in many, many contexts. Um, and we should be doing it in this context much more consistently as well. You say black players need more experience than whites in order to get coaching jobs in the NFL. And black coaches get fewer second chances after a bad season. Here's another one. It wasn't until symphony orchestra auditions were done fully blind despite the strong protestations of the offended music directors that the percentage of women hired in top orchestras climbed from roughly 20% to 40%, even though over some 50 year period, 50% of Juilliard graduates were women. It, incredible stats. And you say here, for the success of DEI efforts, it's crucial to understand illusion and reality when it comes to meritocracy. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's even another study, and this has to do with American football, but that showed that um, Black American football players receive larger yardage penalties for kind of the celebration dance um, than white American football players. Uh, so the, the first ones you were mentioning are just show the strength of of prove it again bias, this celebration dance shows the tightrope um, that certain groups are just supposed to be self-contained and deferential. Other groups can go wild, and that just shows that they have a passion for the business. Prove it again bias has been documented for decades, but we need to start with the evidence. And this is what I love about the book. There's so much evidence, and there's plenty of it, as you say. I'd love to share this idea of prove it again bias in depth. Um, prove it again bias is um, it is such old news. <laughs> I can't even tell you. Some of the one of the major studies was done around 1920, um, and prove it again bias stems from a couple things. Uh, two kind of mechanisms fuel into it. One of them we've already talked about, which is in group favoritism. Sort of if you know you went to private school and played in a rugby league and you know all the right people from the time from your mother's knee. Um, uh, and you you speak a certain way and you know how to dress a certain way. I mean, is, is there still a no brown shoes in the city uh, rule in London? I can't I don't know. But that's <laughs> I didn't thing. know about that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That was that was a class marker at a certain point. If you if you wore brown shoes in the city, you obviously weren't quite quite. Um, but the the in group favoritism. Um, so there you have this this small in group of um, elite white men. And um, they all, you know, know each other and they know the rules of the game. And um, the in-group um, tends to uh, get access to sponsorship, access to valued opportunities, um, and they tend to benefit from what's called leniency bias. Objective rules are often applied leniently to this in-group, but rigorously to everybody else. Um, and so one of the sort of tells of bias that every company should be keeping track of, um, we'll get to this a little later, is that you should be um, choosing people based on um, ratings, objective ratings related to competency. And then you should look at where those uh, um, selected criteria have been waived. Because if you aren't looking of where, where the rules have been waived, I can kind of make a guess. It's for this in-group. So that's one uh, mechanism that produces prove-it-again bias. The, the other is lack of fit. And um, lack of fit, I mean, they, there's this big um, hoopla now about the Finnish prime minister who, um, who had uh, people were posting pictures of her dancing. And... Uh, it was like, oh, uh, that's because when most people think of a prime minister, 
they don't think of a kind of young, attractive woman. Um, and um, so women have to get over that perceived less, lack of fit. And they, I was actually talking to a reporter yesterday, giving the example of Margaret Thatcher. Now, Margaret Thatcher was at a time when I wish she was the first woman prime minister. She actually took voice coaching to make her voice lower. So she, she seemed like a better fit for being prime minister. And so this lack of fit problem means that your mistakes often are noticed more and remembered longer. Your successes are discounted. Oh, she just got lucky, whereas he is skilled. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's all, and stolen idea takes place of like you, you give credit for the idea to somebody who you kind of expected to have good ideas. Um, and typically, that's that small in group. So, lack of uh, proof it again is um, is very pervasive. And you know, you would think when I st first started to study this in the gender context, I thought, well, probably a lot of women face these patterns early in their careers. But you know, no, <laughs> it's like it never ends. <laughs> it's crazy. And you talked there about leniency bias, and that's another term that I learned through your work was. Uh, and I thought about even even in a privileged group. So I played uh, pro rugby. I went on to play pro rugby. I remember one coach, for example, and he didn't like a player. So it was almost like he put on lenses looking for mistakes from that player. Yes, exactly. he'd take them off and he wouldn't see them with the other yeah. guys that he wanted on the team. That's leniency by anybody can make a mistake for the in group. But for the out group, I knew he wasn't a good fit for this team. That's the way it happens. It's the same cognitive process. Let's get into some of the solutions here, because you say one key to controlling it here, controlling prove it again biasing, is to create a pre-agreed structure and follow a disciplined process for evaluating resumes and structuring interviews. And again, this is some of the myriad of content that you offer on biasinterrupters.org. Yeah. In fact, we are, we have been funded by um, the walmart.com to work with companies for free. So we are now working. We have uh, bias interrupters experiments launched in six companies. And next year, we're actually going to be working with the conference board, which is a major business group in the U.S. with 30 companies. So anybody's company is a member of the conference board. Come and get some free, free, uh, free advice. But one of the things that we are doing with these experiments is um, we're working, uh, two of them involve hiring. And you should have um, for resume review, uh, for interviews, at every stage of the hiring process, you should have start, down, start out by saying, this is the job we're going to fill. These are the competencies that are required for this job. And at every stage, every candidate should be rated competency by competency with at least two or three pieces of evidence. And again, where um, a suddenly a competency is waived, that's fine, but you have to keep track and look for patterns about for whom it's waived. The, the, the simple answer for prove it again bias um, uh, is structure, 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 structure. So we worked with this company that started out like that and found that, um, for example, um, only 9.5% uh, of their people of color had leadership mentions in their performance evaluations. That was over 70 points lower than white women. And we all know that like white women are actually the smartest group in every context for everything, but maybe not. So, um, so they, they, this company moved to a competency by competency, give three pieces of evidence, performance evaluation type. And um, they found that first of every single group, including white men, got a lot more improvement oriented feedback. So um, and you have to believe that um, if you give more improvement oriented feedback, you'll probably get more improvement, just a guess. So um, this, I mean, people of color got like 20% more improvement oriented feedback. White women got uh, also doubled the amount, but white men also got more improvement oriented feedback. And that's just a good example where is, if you do move to um, more structure, you're going to not only improve business outcomes, but you'll help every single group.
that's why that's so important. Um, the other thing is, of course, people in, through a training need to know what what prove it again looks like on the ground. You mentioned their feedback, and I, I'm, I I've mixed feelings, Joan, about three hundred and sixty feedback, particularly when they're delivered poorly. I work with organizations, and and sometimes they use 360 feedback and it can be devastating for somebody because their whole world can just crumble around them they think they're this persona in an organization and then it's just proven actually your colleagues don't rate you as highly as you rate yourself and what there's you also a bias that enters in i mean women um there's one study that shows that women who um uh, give negative feedback to their direct reports are rated as less competent and less likable than women who don't know effect for men. So um, 360 feedback, it's a great idea and it can be done well. But if it's not done well, you can have the women who are in charge can get very negative feedback from those below because they're not being sufficiently you know, a good woman, not a so modest, self-effacing and always, always, always nice. There's a quote here to just expand on it further, because this might resonate with some of our audience. You said that women and people of color should not be required to be ever cheerful, never demanding team players, while white men are free to go for the gold. This requires creating an environment where double standards can be brought up and discussed. Otherwise, individuals who resist backlash can just face more backlash for being difficult, intimidating or touchy. Making these changes will help everyone by sending a strong message to all levels of the organization that when you say meritocracy matters, you mean it. Yeah, we talked with um, we, we another organization, we, we looked at their performance evaluation. And we found um, that people of color um, got, got had had wildly more personality problems. Over ninety percent had personality uh, mentioned in their performance evaluations. And um, the but the other thing that was really striking is the extent to which people of color were described as well liked, um, much more so than white people. And um, I, I really didn't understand that until we talked to another man at a different organization we were working on. He said, you know. He was the only black man high up in that organization. He said, you can't get anywhere here as a black man unless you're everybody's best friend. So that is a, and women, um, women who have rough edges are often written off as difficult. Whereas men who uh, have rough edges have a passion for the business and, you know, it could happen to anyone. Uh, the the simple answer is, um, I mean, there's there's new research that shows that if you do tolerate incivility on the job, um, uh, people of color will experience it more, white people and women will experience it more than men will. Um, but of course, you know, everybody ex experiences it. So the, the simple answer is to insist on a certain level of civility on the job. For me, Joan, and probably show you my level of privilege is that when I read this, there's so, so many things I, I think back on working in organizations and I go, was I part of that? Did I not even see it? The other person's going through something that I just was unaware of. I'm a white person. I mean, when I when I began to study um, women of color about 10 years ago, I was completely taken off guard i was going like i was going like okay i live in a different world than i thought i lived in it's shocking but i mean it's so you know most uh, most of us have privilege along some vector you know um um so i think you know we've we've met the enemy and we have to be um humble and persistent and realize that part of this is just being human. There is no view from nowhere. We have to look at things from our own point of view. That's why that cognitive override is so important. And that's why I've spent so long trying to describe bias in five simple patterns. So people don't have to quit their day job to understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, and which is also great, because, as you said, sometimes bias training is just, wow, that's really interesting. What do I do with it, though? And you make it practical for people. I think we've time for one more question for part one. And for our audience, Joan has kindly agreed to come back and do part two. We're going to do part two. But one last thing I wanted to cover before then, 
is the backlash against diversity training. Because like I said, there, you can have somebody who kind of goes, Oh, my God, I was totally unaware of this. Or I saw flickers of it here and there throughout the organization, I didn't know what to do with it. But then you have some people kind of go, what? I, re I receive reverse uh, problems here as a white male, even though this is going on. And I'll start us off with, here with a quote, you say, the backlash against diversity is very real, though it varies a lot by industry. In comments on our national surveys, over four times as many engineers as lawyers commented that diversity was threatening the quality of their profession. Men in STEM, science, technology, engineering and math are more reluctant than women and more reluctant than men in other fields to accept evidence of gender bias. The backlash in engineering reflects the view that engineering is highly meritocratic and should be disconnected from social and political concerns. Again, you may not experience this in your industry, but it's out there in some under industry. And it's out there in every industry. It's it, it's just different. There are different levels in different uh, in different types of industries. You know, one um, engineering company we worked with in the United States, um, one third of the white men said things like, "Our company's focusing too much on diversity, and it's jeopardizing meritocracy." Um, or there's there's no I've never seen any racism or sexism here, and people are just obsessed with it. Um, so the this backlash against diversity is very um, is very common, and um, there are a couple things you can do to try to um, head it off at the past. One we've already mentioned include social class in your um, diversity initiative. Include age in your diversity initiative, those are vectors of social inequality that affect white men. Um, and if you're talking about every single vector that, uh, except for the ones that affect men, the understandable reaction of white men is like, you know, this is, this is nonsense. This is nonsense. I'm not privileged. Um, so the, the other thing that um, is really important to head off backlash uh, against diversity is to understand that every single thing you do in the diversity context has a subtext. And the subtext is we're a meritocracy. Um, so there is going to arise um, a, a narrative that you're corroding meritocracy. It has to be countered with the other narrative of like, sadly, you know, we, do, we don't have, we found out we don't have a meritocracy for everybody. And what we're trying to do is to perfect meritocracy, not erode it. John, I think that's a great place to take a pause for part one. We'll be back for part two with the teddy bear effect. We'll find out about the masculinity contest that sometimes works becomes because it becomes almost shameful to go and take paternity time off. Or we'll come back also with the problems for women who leave work and come back and the prove it again bias. There's so much in the book, every aspect of bias in the workplace and organizations and the solutions are all covered by Joan. Joan, for those people who have an interest, we've said it a couple of times, but where can they find out more about you and the book? Well, joancwilliams.com is my personal webpage. Um, the, it's published by Harvard Business Review Press. So it's very widely available um, in Europe. And the www.biasinterrupters.org has lots of free tools that are evidence-based and will actually help you make progress. I want to thank our guest today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to the author of Bias Interrupted, Joan C. Williams. Thank you for joining us. And that's it for part one of Bias Interrupted with Joan C. Williams. Don't forget, I have a copy up for grabs. Just sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter. And don't forget, go to her brilliant resource, which is biasinterrupters.org. Finally, just want to thank our sponsor, Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and transfer funds with ease. Check out Zai at hellozai.com. See you very soon for part two of Bias Interrupted.